All right, so um, thank you, John. Thank you, Louis, for having me. And thank you all for coming this morning. Um, I am going to <laughs> share a story with you this morning um, about being a tool builder. I've got our little tags up here. I use Instagram. I didn't find an iOS dev camp Instagram, so I just use the hashtag on there, but just throwing that out there. So on the Twitters, um, there you are if you're tweeting along. So let's get started, shall we? So I am a tool builder. Um, despite my confetti shirt and bright yellow hair, I am a tool builder. Um, I want to give you a little bit of history about how I became a tool builder. And then what this is really about is how I used my tools um, as, as a product designer, as a tool maker, to redesign my entire life and uh, start doing the best work of my life. So let's get into it, shall we? So really a life story. Um, ages 12 through 23, um, I had a lot of jobs. I was a dishwasher, a waitress, heavy equipment washer. My dad actually owned a sand and gravel company, and uh, if I wasn't working as a dishwasher or a waitress, I was washing giant tires that were bigger than me. And if I didn't do a good job, I had to do it again. <laughs> so that was super fun. Um, when I was old enough to drive, I got to be a pilot car driver where you drive a regular size vehicle in front of a really big one that's pulling something even bigger. So that was pretty cool. Um, a sign painter, as I got a little older, liked art, that kind of stuff, I started doing some sign painting. Um, production assistant, this helped me work my way through college. Um, I did film and video production. I was basically a grip. I ran um, heavy equipment. I carried the beta cams for the camera guys. I ran tapes and logged tape in the video sat truck and all kinds of cool stuff. So anything that needed to be done, I did that as a production assistant in film and video world. Uh, I was a bank teller for three months, <laughs> and, and that was fun. I didn't like it because I had to dress nice, and that wasn't really for me. I was also a park ranger seasonally during the summers, again, working my way through school. And my degree, I graduated with a degree in 1998 in metal sculpture. And I graduated and went, what now? How am I going to make a living? And um, so that brings us to about 1998, where um, as a film and video production assistant, I moved to the San Francisco Bay Area with the plan of doing that production assistanting um, while finishing or starting and finishing a grad degree. Um, and what happened is I had a lot of downtime in this job it, as a production assistant for this small film and video company who did specialized camera equipment for huge events like the Olympics and Pan Am games. And so they had like, they provided like camera cranes and steady cams and stuff like that. But so I helped the owner organize things and book travel and book camera crews and all this cool stuff and file things and answer phones and, and all, all of that. But in my downtime in 1998, I learned that, that the internet was really cool. And um, I wanted to learn how to make websites. And so while the crew was away on these trips doing all the cool stuff, I got to stay, stay back and hold down the fort. And um, I taught myself how to code websites. And so I did that by like view source. I would use view source and I would copy and paste it into BB edit and then figure out um, like how to make, how did, how did they do this? That was how I taught myself how to make websites. And then I wanted to learn how to do the design aspect as well. So I used Adobe Classroom and a book <laughs> way back with the CD-ROM in the back to learn how to use Photoshop. Um, and eventually it kind of came together. I built a website for this company that I was working for. And this began a really cool, long career for me of web design. Um, their clients were like, whoa, who built your website? And I got to tell you, you can find it like on the Wayback Machine. It is not pretty. But <laughs> in 1998, I was very proud of it. And, um, and so their clients started going, whoa, who built your website? Will they build one for me? And, and eventually, I left um, and I, I moved on to like a dot-com startup in 1999. Um, and I, be, I was a production artist there. And I started learning how to do more stuff. And anyway, that led me from, from there. I went on to UNLV as a web designer. And then I started teaching while I was there. And so there's this whole thing. But basically, the underlying is I moved from like way back in 1998 and 99 
um, it wasn't, there wasn't such a big division in developing and designing. Like if you designed a website, you had to know how to code it too. And so that was just how I learned. And then eventually there was like the divide and I was like, well, I'll lean more on the design side because I love design. It's, it's my thing, it's where my heart is. So um, it was really cool though. Like er it seemed like every, everything that I was excited about, uh, like one door led to another door eventually. Um, I moved back to Vegas from the San Francisco Bay Area. UNLV is where I, I took on a web job and then I was invited to teach management information systems. There's a lot of stuff I'm just gonna glaze over in here. Um, but I got to teach management information systems at UNLV and then I was invited by the art department that I had graduated from to go teach over there and, and design an interface design curriculum. So a lot of stuff happened in between but just to give you a general sense because you know life stories can take a while. Anyway, so designer, and this, this takes us all the way up um, until this date. Um, and so everything was going well. I had this really cool career. I was loving what I was doing. And I had gone through, um, you know, from UNLV, I went on to a company called Eat Drink, who was doing really cool like flash animations and websites way back then. And so I got to go work with those guys and I eventually became a partner there. Zappos was a client of ours. And when the economy shifted in 2008, we had to close our doors on Eat Drink and I ended up joining Zappos full time. Zappos was a really cool kind of pivotal moment for me in my career. So I had kind of climbed the ropes, you know, I'd been moved on to like owning my own shop and then having to close it down was super painful. Um, in 2009, we did that. And 2009, I'm just gonna like run over a few really crazy things that happened in 2009. 2009, in February, I had my second child. In March, we closed our company that I loved, the animation shop that I was talking about. In April, I filed for a divorce in a marriage that I'd been in for 14 years. Um, in May, I joined Zappos, started a new job, completely different. Um, and then just like the year continued to just be completely crazy. Um, my sister moved in with me after my ex-husband moved out. She was also going through divorce, two kids, and we just, it was just crazy. And then my dad, who was a little bit throughout my life had trouble. He was a Vietnam veteran and he had spent stints of time in and out of like veterans hospitals and mental wards and stuff like that. So that was a thing that I was used to but he hadn't been in um, you know, one of those facilities for many years. And this year, that like 2009, he had a lapse and had to go back um, into one of those facilities. So that, that was, uh, grab some water here. That was one of those things. So 2009 was kind of crazy. Um, and 2010, I spent kind of restabilizing. And then um, my projects at Zappos, my favorite projects now, the projects that I got to focus on at Zappos were, um, my first project was overhauling the look and feel of the Zappos.com website, which was a super cool, super huge project. And then my second project, after building a design team to support what we had done, were the first mobile apps at Zappos. Those were a lot of fun, but by the time I finished, um, by the time our team finished building those apps, I was kind of like ready to move on to the next thing. I didn't want to just keep working on it and iterating it. Other folks could do that. The excitement for me was starting something new. And so it was time for me to move on. I left in 2011 and I ended up joining a small mobile app dev team who did a lot of work for like Apple and a lot of um, really big brands and stuff, maybe even Capital One at some point. <laughs> but we did a lot of um, mobile app development, high-end stuff, and it was really cool. And I got to work from home. Everything seemed awesome, like my career, right? So I have all of these jobs that I've men mentioned and they've given me like a lot of tools. We'll get back to that. Everything was going really, really well until this date. And this date is really monumental to me because I was uh, starting my work day, working from home, and um, like I normally do, it was a Monday morning. My dad had stayed the night, the night before, and he left, and then I took my girls to school, and then I started my, you know, go back home into my little home office, and I start my day. And after a few hours, um, I get a phone call from my stepmom and she's like, hey, your dad was supposed to be here an hour ago. Have you seen him? Did he leave You know, when he, at eight or whatever? And um, turns out he, he was in a motorcycle accident and he never made it home. And that event really changed a lot of things for me. And let me explain why. So my expectation with this loss 
was that I would be able to handle the loss of my dad the way I had lost, um, handled loss before in my life. When I was 11 years old, I lost my 15-year-old brother in a car accident. It was a drunk driving accident. And um, through that loss, my parents used that, that as an opportunity to teach my sister and I that you can take a negative experience and find something positive in it, and that life is short. To always remember that life is short, and don't waste time on things that don't bring you joy or value. And so they also taught us <laughs> to love what we do for a living, love what you spend your time on. And nothing proved to me that I had followed my heart and found a career that I loved more than when I was 27 years old, and in that whole timeline of jobs and things that I was explaining, when I was 27, I think the year was 2002, um, I lost my mom very unexpectedly. And that totally shook my world. I was very close with my mom. And um, what helped me at that time was that I had work I loved. I didn't have kids at the time, but I loved my work. And I poured my pain and my passion and all of the emotion that I was feeling right back into my work. And somehow it made my work better. It made me better at what I did. People were noticing what I was doing. People wanted to work with me, and that was awesome. So that was how I was dealing with it. So my expectation with my loss of my dad was that I could pour my, my pain and my sorrow into my work and that I would get through this and I would be okay. But you know what? That didn't happen. This time it was like work was the little balloon and I was the string. And somebody just came along and snipped the string. And instead of soaring off and recovering like I had before, I just <laughs> fell like a limp little noodle to the ground. And I kept trying to work through it. I was like, I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to keep working through it. And I worked, I worked for a company, but from home. And they were very supportive and trying to give me time. I was working on projects I liked. I didn't hate the clients. It was kind of cool. On paper, everything looked good, but I couldn't make it work here. I couldn't get back into my work. And as a designer, as a user experience, as the director of user experience was my role. Um, but I knew that I couldn't, I couldn't keep trying to make this work when I'm not emotionally invested. That would be irresponsible design. If you are not emotionally invested in your designs as a designer, you got no business doing it. And I didn't want to be an irresponsible designer. So by the time I reached the end of 2012, and that was after eight months of trying to work through it, I realized that I was in like a full on burnout. It wasn't just like the loss, the pain of the loss. Like I just, I, I was starting to feel physically ill every time I would think about making wireframes or doing work. Um, like I, I, work that I once loved, loved. I could know like, like every time I was like, hey, you wanna do this? project of contacts management app, and I was like, mm, like physically ill. No, I can't, not only do I not want to do it, I can't. I can't physically find the whatever it takes to do this. So that brings us right into uh, the start of 2013. The thing with what I was feeling, whether it was burnout, whether it was depression, whether it was like grieving or a combination of all those things, I knew that I had to keep going. I didn't want to keep going. I reached a point where keep going was really like, hmm. But it wasn't just me. I have two little girls, a single mom at this point, and um, I'm like, yeah, I, that's, not what, that's not the message I want to teach them. That's not what I want to leave them with. I want to show them that I can get through this and that I can overcome whatever this shit is. Forgive the language there, but. I, I want to get through this, and I want to show them that we can be stronger than our circumstance. All right, so funny thing, funny thing, this guy. Um, I, it, it genuinely didn't occur to me at the time, like it, hindsight 2020, it didn't occur to me that I could seek professional help. <laughs> so I looked for like inspiration wherever I could find it. I'm an Apple nerd. This guy was inspiring to me, he still is. And so I want to share this little video. For some of you, it may be familiar. For many, it may not. I don't know. So let's just take a minute and watch this video. Maybe. Ah, no. 
I swear it was there a second ago. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is, and your, your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, that, that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this... Uh, this uh, erroneous notion that life is is there and you're just going to live in it versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. Oh. Do you ever, have you ever had that moment where you're like, you know, maybe you've seen it a dozen times or whatever, but you hear like the thing that you need to hear at the time you need to hear it. That was that for me. It was just, you know, one of those days I was kind of going through stuff and, and I was just like, you know, he said good stuff. And poke life, poke life. You can shape it, you can change it. I was like, hmm, hmm, there's something there. So I had this moment where I was like, you know, I don't really know how to get out of burnout. I just know I need to. What if, what if, let's just focus on Mary Poppins here for a second. So I, I was thinking, I was like, you know, I have all these tools. I've had all of these jobs. We've all had all these experiences in life, right? And they give us like a bag, a Mary Poppins bag of tools. And if you've ever worked on a project before, there's never a one size fits all solution that you just apply, like can of solution, done, right? But we have this bag of tools and experiences that we can apply to things as different circumstances arise. And I was like, okay, okay. So like, skills I have. This is my representation of building a product. <laughs> it was like, you have an idea. Anyway, so like, skills I have. I was thinking about skills. I know how to build products. I know how to build products. I'd won awards for building products and all kinds of fancy, cool things like that. People hired me for those things. Then I was teaching other people how to build cool products. So I got that down. Life, not so much, but there are parallels in life and product. And I was like, what if? I just turn that whole thing around and design my life as if it's a product, like same process that I would use if I were getting a, a client came to me and said, I need you to design a really nice life for me, if that's the product. Well, that's what I was deciding to do. And I was like, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna science me. I'm gonna science me. And I'm gonna figure this out, I'm gonna experiment. Like Steve Jobs said, I'm gonna poke things, poke life and see what happens. And so I started kind of just boiling out, um, <laughs> like, if this is a product, where do I start? And, and I always start with the why. Why? What is the reason that I'm going to be doing this? I knew that I needed to um, get out of burnout, like that, my big why, but that, that was more the goal, not necessarily the why, right? So in order to figure out what my why was, I had this amazing um, conversation with a friend. First, I want to point out, breakdown occurs when clarity of vision is lacking. Have you ever had a project go like awry? <laughs> it's like often it's because you don't have the full big picture, right? Something is missing. Somebody has a piece of the puzzle. Somebody else has another piece, and you've got what something in the middle. Clarity of vision. If you've got clarity of vision, you know where you're going. You've got a direction, and you know how to get there. You can figure that out. My friend Stefan said to me in this, I was like, I gotta go, I gotta leave this job. I did quit my job in 2013, by the way, um, to, to go figure out all this. And um, I was in, in this call with Stefan and I said, you know, like I gotta leave, but I don't know what's next. And he said to me, he said, it's not about what's next. And he didn't say it all prophetic and like, but he it was just like in passing. He's like, oh, it's not about what's next. It's about what's important. But that was one of those things that I needed to hear at that moment too, right? It's not about what's next. 
It's about what's important. And I was like, oh, that's right. Just like with a product, with a product, we have to ask why. So I made this list. And these all would be the equivalent, like a company has core values or a product has design principles. And if you have design principles for a product, you can look at those design principles. And anytime somebody comes to you with a feature, you can say, does it align with the design principles? Yes, then great, move forward. No, get it out of here. I don't have time for it. And these were the things that I came up with um, in that moment. This is what, what was important to me at this time, in this moment. These were the things that I wanted to focus on. No matter what it was I was going to do, I was going to make sure that it aligned with something here on this list, that it was a yes or no. And it became my compass of intention. This is the intention. This is the kind of life I want to live. This is where I want to be. This is what's important. And sometimes, you know, I hate to say that it took loss to get me to think about these things, but it took loss to get me to think about these things in this way. And so I started thinking about things in this way. This is, a, this is what my life needs to be about to me. Everybody will have their own. Um, but this was what it was to me. And so now I had my why. I needed to think about my what, right? My what was to figure out burnout. So I knew that. So I knew I needed to start brainstorming some things out. OK, just like I would do for a project. I need to understand my context, all the things I have going on, daily rituals, whatever it is, existing patterns, environment, the things that I have to work with. Sometimes it's like, you know, you find what's stopping you along the way. This is like when you're starting to think about all these things in your context. You think about what's stopping you. You think about the tools that you have to work with and maybe the tools you don't have that you need to acquire in order to accomplish a thing. Um, with the why nots, the ones I hear most often and I found myself in, I don't have time, I can't afford it, I don't know how, it won't be good enough, um, those sorts of things we gotta work through. Tools that we have, well, I know what tools I've got to work with. Maybe I needed a few more and I gotta work on those, but that's where I start. Um, I look at what I've got. I take that Mary Poppins bag and dump it out on the table and start sorting through everything so that I can figure it out. And then I look at my goals and I start, I start saying, okay, now we've got the what, right? We've got the goals that we want. We know why we're building a thing. We're going to change a thing. And we know what we're going to focus on. Now we need to get to work. And so once you've dumped all those pieces out on the table, it becomes like a puzzle. And you start moving things around and seeing what fits and what works. So solving puzzles. I, wanna, I put a little note on here. So I, I've done two talks that go into more detail on how I actually worked through these things. There are two 30-minute talks on this page if you're interested. One's called Through Burnout and Back Again, which is the first part of this talk, um, and then more detail. And the second one is called No Excuses, which is how I like, actually got out of my own way and started making a practice of, of doing things, which led to greater things eventually. So by 2014, all of this work that I was doing, all these little practices that I was, I would do 30-day sprints of things, it's just to like life things, writing things, um, posting videos, learning how to do new skills, you know, just like little 30-day sprints. And at the end of 30 days, I'd figure out what I was gonna do next. And the more that I did it, it opened up like this whole new world for me. And I began teaching what I was going through and, and sharing my struggle and my success and my you know, failures. And, and the more I put it out into the world, the more people were like, hey, I wanna pay you to do that. Come to this company and help teach my team. And um, I started putting a lot more value in the well-being of teams because healthy teams can make healthy products which result in you know, a happier customer experience. This is my belief. So I was, I was able to use all my skills and kind of shift from design to teaching people how to have care-invested design. And, uh, and it was working out. It was great. By the time I hit two, four, 2014, I had like a nice little coaching career going. And, um, and that was awesome. So now it was time to like iterate. Part of, if you remember my little list up there, one of the things on my list was to make more space in my life, or like just make more space. And what that meant to me was to recalibrate, I was always in a hurry, always like rushing and hurrying and arbitrary timelines, like yeah, get this done, ah, stressful timeline. Um, I didn't want that in my life anymore. I wanted to have time to feel my way through things. And so, poking life, like Steve said, 
I, I started experimenting with just slowing down, leaving 10 minutes earlier, you know, going to the airport an hour early, like making time um, to spend with my kids. You know, I left Zappos and I, um, I specifically wanted to work from home because I wanted to be more present for my girls. Um, and so just things like that. And, and as a result, I was ending up with more time. I had more time to do stuff that I cared about. And it was just because I was controlling my time. I was saying yes, I was saying no to things that aligned with that compass of intention. So um, in, in iterating to improve, I was finding myself with more time. I was finding that I could control when I was doing coaching stuff. And, and it, was, it was just getting better and better and better. And um, <laughs> that takes us to this one moment. This one moment, I'm working from home. And everybody doing all right? Just wanna check in with you. All right, so this is, takes us to this moment where I'm working from home. It's Christmas break, my kids are home, that's cool. And my daughter Zia, she's almost seven at the time that she brings me this, and she says, she's like, I drew this amazing picture, mom. And then kids draw you pictures, and I was like, awesome, I'll put it in the drawing box in the garage. You know, in my mind I'm thinking that. But I was like, that's so amazing, good job, kiddo. And, um, and I go, you know, I look at it and I'm thinking in my mind, I constantly at this, at this point in time, thinking about my list of what's important. I'm like, mm, make more space, be a good mom. How can I make a moment out of this? Let's make this dress. I think I could make this dress. It's just a bunch of color blocks, right? I have basic sewing skills, basic sewing skills, and I have a sewing machine. So, and I know how to thread it if the, the thread breaks. So I was like, let's, do you want to make this dress real? And she's like, yeah. And so I was like, let's go to the fabric store. And um, so we go to the fabric store and like $100 in fabric and supplies <laughs> later, we come home and I start like, I start constructing this dress. Um, and, and so I had never done this before. I'd never patterned a dress before, but it was fun. I figured it out with stick figures and things. That's my thing, I love stick figures. But I started figuring it out and started sewing these pieces together, had a lot of help from my cat, Rocky, and because they help, they lay on things, hold them flat. Um, you know, so, but like a few days later, three days and 12 hours worth of time later, because I really like document my time and where I'm spending it, I put this dress on Z, and I wasn't done with the collar or the hem, but I wanted to need to kind of do a fit check. And I put this dress on her and she goes, I'm wearing my imagination. And I was just like, oh my God, that's so sweet. That's so awesome. Can I finish it now? No, I'm not taking it off. And she wears it everywhere, everywhere, everywhere we go. <laughs> so now we're in 2015, everywhere we go. She's wearing this dress and everywhere we go, people are like, oh my gosh, where did you get that dress? It's amazing. And she's like, I just and I was like, that's so cool, that's so cool. And that's a magical thing as a parent to see a kid with so much excitement about something that she created. She created that, and, you know, it was like, and that's her best friend Gigi, and they've been inseparable since age two and a half. They met at daycare, and anyway, still friends today. And um, anyway, so we get all these compliments as we go out, and my boyfriend, and so by this time, I got a boyfriend. And I'm not a single mom anymore, I'm an independent mom with a boyfriend. Anyway, my boyfriend says to me, he goes, he goes, you know, you got something here. And um, I was like, yeah, I'm not sewing things for other people's children, no. Have you seen what kids come up with? Like, no, can you imagine that? Like sewing things, no, no. But he goes, he goes well, what if, what if, instead of recreating it like you did, what if they actually just wore the actual like crayon art, what if they actually just wore the drawing? I was like, whoa, 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 that's a why, that's a why, that's a good why pro product, right? Okay, so now I had something. But he goes, what if, what if they wear the drawing, but we make it simpler so that there's some consistency so that we can actually handle this? What if it's a coloring sheet? Kids understand coloring, coloring books and stuff like that, make it simple, and this shape this shape, we determined that if you do two of these exactly the same, front and back, and sew them together, you got a dress, it's awesome. Um, so simple shape, coloring sheet, something they can print out at home, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, little outline, and, um, and then we could, we could make it real, we could just print their actual drawing. So that was interesting. Now we had a what, right? <laughs> so, well, the, the what too, so why, why, why? 
I forgot to kind of recap the why. The why was that moment of magic, right, that I felt with Zia, that Zia felt and that I felt when she put the dress on and she was like, I'm wearing my imagination. Like, that was magic. That was a magical moment. And that was the moment that, you know, like, not in that moment we said, oh, we have a product here. It wasn't that. It was after like three months of seeing how people reacted and how she reacted to wearing her design. Like, it was amazing. It was amazing. And that was what Ken was saying, you know? Like, how can we give that to other parents? How can other people have that experience? That's our why. Um, the what is, okay, now we got it simplified. They print out a coloring sheet. They do the artwork, however they can imagine, and take a smartphone photo, upload it to a website. Now we got, now we got a what? And so um, we brainstormed, we got all our tools, we dumped out our bag, we figured out what's stopping us, we knew what we wanted, and we knew what tools we had, and also we had to figure out what tools we didn't have. So our next step was to call in some help because we knew we couldn't do it all ourselves. We um, all, uh, four of us, so Stefan is the guy who actually said that what, you know, it's not what's important, <laughs> or it's not about what's next, it's about what's important. He's the guy that I worked with. He had moved on, we worked together in the past, but um, he had moved on to become a partner with his wife in Honey Crumb Cakes amazing bakery out of Seattle. Um, Ignazio Lachitignola, we worked together. He was the first designer I hired at Zappos. So we had a great working relationship. He had since left Zappos and gone on to form his own design shop. So we reached out to these guys for some help. And just great people. And one of those bullet points that I had somewhere along the way was like, like work with people I love, doing things I love. Well, these are people I love. So we were gonna work on something that we were excited about. All right, so, um, so we call Iggy. We say, hey, want to build a website in exchange for equity for a thing that may never you know, be? Anyway, he's like, yeah, awesome, just as long as it can happen on the side of my, my paid work. And same with Stefan. We needed him to make phone calls because Ken and I are terrible at making phone calls. Like, I'm bad at making phone calls. It's a big fear that I have. I, I hate it. I don't know why, but I, I don't like making phone calls to people I don't know. And Ken is worse than me. You know Ken. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, so we got some help. We needed help with logistics. Stefan made phone calls to figure out if somebody could help us make prototypes. And um, now we had to get to work. We had all the pieces. And this takes us into uh, early 2016. So from about, it took us about 10 months. We got some prototypes made. We started testing things. Our first prototype, Zia wearing it, we kind of tried to recreate her original dress in a drawing form and then have her wear it. So this was super cool. This was super cool, like it was becoming real. Our idea had a prototype and it was like, oh, this is working, this is super awesome. And so then we needed the website. So Iggy had been working on the, the website all along the way. It took about 10 months. And, um, and one day he was just like, okay, I got the website. I took these photos with my iPhone <laughs> because we were just like, whatever, proof of concept, that's all we need. Just something that functions and that gets the idea out there. And um, I don't know other kids and models and stuff. Like, I don't know these things. I, I know. Three, I have two daughters, Sophia and Zia. Sophia wants nothing to do with dresses ever, which is fine, but we just, proof of concept. Anyway, so best friend Gigi, um, <laughs> super little model. Um, so they helped us, we did the iPhone photos one day and prototypes and Iggy plugged them into the site, we had a site. And, um, and so the only thing left to do was to launch it. So 6.22 a.m., August 17th, 2016, I made this tweet. And i just like to note that this tweet actually changed my life. It's kind of weird, not a thing you expect. Now, it didn't get a ton of likes or retweets relative in the scale of like a viral scene or whatever, but the craziest thing happened. So I post this tweet, 6.22 in the morning. By 5 p.m., our site completely crashed. And we were like, what's going on? So a little bit of searching, and we discovered that TechCrunch had written a write-up on us, same day that we launched. Crazy. So they wrote, an article on us, our website crashed, we had to fix it, we got it back up and running. So that was crazy, but it's not like we saw all these crazy sales coming in immediately. Part of our proof of concept concern was, will people actually go to a website, print out a paper, go away, let their kid design it, then come back to actually place an order? We didn't know if people would do it. So all these things started happening. TechCrunch went on product hunt, and then bam, 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 bam. It was just like, it, it kind of went boom. It did go viral, and um, Disney's Babbel.com did an interview, and then a write-up, and from there's Huffington Post, and, and it just started going all around the world. And some other company had done a, a Skype interview with me, and they posted a video on, um, 
on Facebook and it got 3 million views within the first 24 hours and that's when we started seeing some sales and then it kind of, um, it kind of capped out at 40 million and we were kind of like, oh my gosh. Um, but what was crazy is we, we did this video or they did this video, they launched the video. We didn't pay for it, it was just somebody was excited about what we were doing and, um, and, and we did $10,000 worth of sales that one day and we were like, oh. We proved the concept, oh crap, now we gotta ship. Because <laughs> we had not shipped a single product at this point. So that was scary. And we started, um, we started doing stuff, but the media stuff just continued. Um, one thing after another, like Ashton Kutcher reposted it, it got like 200,000 views, Amy Poehler invited us, George Takei. Um, we were on the Harry Connick Jr. show, which was super weird because I had a crush on him when I was like 14, and then all of a sudden we're like old and there, and it was really cool, but really weird. Anyway, so we had all these amazing um, experiences just kind of kept unfolding and unfolding, and sales continued, and were really solid, and it was awesome because this had kind of come out of, you know, this was a proof of concept, and it was because we'd made space in our life, right? We were poking life, <laughs> we were poking life. So like, this was it, I was like, oh, holy macaroni, Steve was right, Steve was right, you guys. Like, you can poke at life, and he said that if you poke, something will happen, and you can shape it, and you can change it, and you can make tools that other people use. And so, like, we were, we were just, kind of reeling in, in all of this, this moment, but the most amazing thing wasn't what we were experiencing. It was what these artists were experiencing. We made a tool that allowed kids to express their imagination and love it. And then even people like Mosquito Hate Blog, which seems evil, um, <laughs> says this is cute. And it was a very shareable thing, like 66,000 likes, that's sweet. So people we're not paying for this marketing or advertising. People are sharing what their kid made because their kid is feeling that feeling, that feeling of magic that we had, me and Z, in that moment. Like, it's happening, you guys. It's awesome, we made a tool and people are using it. Steve was right, it's awesome. So that was happening. And like, look at the confidence. Oh my gosh. And like, I love it. She's like, yeah, right, I made this. And you know what, like, they love it. They love it, and, and I love that they love it. Down here, there's a little line that says like made by or designed by, and what we do is we actually print their handwriting in the hem, so like they can be like, my name is in this dress, like if they wanna share that, they, they can, but it's a keepsake like longer beyond the wear of the garment. Um, and then, then, you know, another thing Steve says is like if you, you give people tools and then like they make stuff, like sometimes like things that you never imagined would happen with your product start happening. Uh, you know, we have, we make mobile apps, right? Like Apple put a thing out there and we make apps and we make a living out, anyway. Like this was not Halloween, this was like a Tuesday. This is amazing to me. <laughs> so I just wanted, like, then people started getting like, more and more creative. They used the wall texture and made a dress that matched. And we do doll sizes too, so they can make a little matching doll size. And just to share, that was like a clever fabric saving technique on our part. We're like, there's a lot of scrap fabric here. What can we do with that? We can make matching doll sizes. Yes. So less waste. Um, so that was cool. And then like once you get an idea out there, um, you got to iterate on it, right? Like so we keep going through this process. This is like the same process that I applied to my life, changed my life, now we got a product, and we apply the process, and you just kind of keep going through this cycle again. And yet, this is all still aligning with my why. That why, that list, my compass of intention, it's all still aligning. It's, it's all still making sense. But in iteration, when we launched, we had launched with only dresses because it was a proof of concept and it was based on something simple. T-shirts are a lot more complex. They have collars and sleeves and we do cut and sew and it's a lot more complex. But we had, we had people like, you hate boys, you're sexist. And it was like, no, I don't hate boys. I don't hate boys, I like them, they're great. And here, now we have T-shirts. So it took us a few months to get T-shirts out and so we got T-shirts I'm like, look at these guys. He's so cool. You wanna see a cool kid? <laughs> I want to be that cool. I love it. And then adult sizes was the next thing. Like people were like, oh, I want to make it too. I, ha I have artwork that I want to put on. I, I do things. Um, and I love my kids' art, but I want to make it a little bit nicer or whatever, something I would wear. Um, and so adult stuff. And then families started doing cool stuff. And um, man, and then girls. Like girls don't all want to wear rainbows and unicorns, as it turns out, right? Like, so we have girls that are making amazing, scary, or just like steampunk, like it's so cool what, what we're seeing 
our customers do, and they inspire us, and then we start doing things. And, and so that's a real dog. <laughs> that's so crazy. She poked her, she made a little hole and poked the dog's head through, took a picture of the template, uploaded it, and then ordered the doll size for her dog to wear. Like, that's so crazy. We would have never thought of that. Um, and, then, and then we get inspired too. Like, their ideas then fuel us, so we do stuff to show that, yeah, there's a lot more possible than just crayons and markers, peanut butter and jelly, and then that Starry Night iteration, I did that with Play-Doh. And just like, so we did a 30-day challenge, to show people you can use cotton candy and, and milk and markers and can whatever. And um, I also, like I'm a metalhead sort of, so I recreated my Iron Maiden, my favorite killer shirt, out of Play-Doh. And I know it looks sort of goofy, but it's out of Play-Doh, you guys. So now I get to play with Play-Doh for work and it's really cool and I love that. And, and then we just start to show like other things. So we do these like smackdowns where people will vote and the winning one, we make it real to show what it looks like when it's real. So this is super fun. That's a cotton candy dress. A cotton candy dress, plastic spoons. Um, it's amazing what you can do. But this, this, going back to where it really like hits home, is this little girl had made a dress in our first year. When we first launched, she was seven, but she posted this tweet on her account, and she's like, this is where my love for design all started. I'm ready to keep designing and have my own clothing line. And she's nine now, and she made her first dress when she was seven. And like, I saw that, and I was just like, oh, I get goosebumps when I think of it. She's using the tools, but it's planting the seed that I can make something. I can have an idea and make it real. We can all do that. We can all do that. We can all have an idea and make it real. And then this one, like, my daughter designed this dress with Legos and a drawing, got the dress made with a picture of this, her voice, her choice, her design, and she wants to wear it on the first day of school. That's engagement. Like, that brought tears to my eyes the first time I read that tweet. I was just like, you guys, like this means something to me. This is work I care about and love doing and incidentally it seems to be making an impact and I like that. And it's not like big world changing impact. I'm not like saving the world in any way. Or, but this one, I know this is a very blurry um, thing but I could only uh, do a screenshot. It's a stage four cancer for kids, New York City. They have a broadcast unit. We donated 30 shirts um, to 30 kids with stage four cancer who don't get to go home, have to stay in the hospital, and they asked me to do like a 30 minute broadcast um, to explain like how things work, but they could text me during this broadcast and show me what they were working on. And like that part was incredibly moving, but do you wanna know what was really moving about this? Uh, forgive me if I cry. Uh, so after, a few weeks later, we got some texts from parents who were there with their kids when they got to create this thing and some of those kids didn't get to leave the hospital. But their parents reached out to tell us how much that experience and that keepsake meant to them. Like, dude, that moves me. That moves me, and I'm honored to be a part of that. So we wanna do more of that. All right, pull it together. All right, so iteration. I'm gonna just coast through a little few last things here. Um, Thank you for joining me on this journey, by the way. So just a, a couple little things. We did 1.2 million in our first 18 months. Um, we used the money that we earned to pour it back into the company. We rebuilt all of our internal systems from scratch. We had built our initial thing on WordPress and used a bunch of plugins for customization. And every time one plugin would update, all the others would break, and it was a very unstable system. And then doing one-of-a-kind things for shipping it was very hard to find a system that existed already that worked. So we built one out of React, which I'd never worked in before, but it's been a learning experience. I didn't code it myself. We used a real developer, but, um, but I learned a lot in the process. So we um, brought our manufacturing. It was always local in Vegas, but we brought it 100% in-house. We invested our money in the equipment, the space, and everything loan-free. We've never had an investor. It's all self self-created, self-funded. Um, we, we use the money that we earned though to buy these big massive machines and bring our manufacturing in-house. We make every single piece in Vegas. And um, we launched an affiliate program, which doesn't sound like a huge deal, but we coded it ourselves and it was pretty magical. But we did that because we brought our prices down. Our Facebook community, which is funny, is I never used Facebook before, but that's where our community is. And I know these people, like I know these people. I know Donita and Kimmy, and I know, you know, like Natalie and, and Rose and Ed. When they come on to talk, <laughs> we do these really cool things. So this is a screenshot of our system. Um, yeah, that we built. But this is, um, 
just a time lapse of Ken and I running our machine, like just do this is what we do every day, <laughs> making the stuff. We run it to flat fabric, um, and then we, um, we hand cut it, and I'm gonna just run into here real quick. And we do these live streams now, where we show the process, and then I also answer questions from the community. People ask different questions, you don't have to read all that, but it's just different questions that people will ask, and I answer them while hand cutting a lot of the products. I don't do them all, we have a team of three, um, but it shows people not only what, um, like, like who's making their product, but how it's made, and people really like that. They like understanding what they're spending their money on, and the kids get so excited, and if the parents are able to catch their, um, their product that they ordered, um, I can give the kid a shout out, and it's super cool. Like, the kids are like, oh my god, it's super awesome. So, and then we just, here's a behind the scenes of the live streams when they happen. And so that's just what, the, what it looks like, cutting t-shirts, the, the collars and the sleeves. People are like, what is that? Is that a diaper? And I'm like, no, it's sleeves for a t-shirt. But um, that's a thing. That's a thing that we do. Um, I'm running out of time here. We're getting ready to launch a couple more products, uh, chemo beanies and leggings. We're not there yet. Leggings have been a beast with our process. Um, but collaborations have, have been the new thing of 2019 that we're really excited about. Disney reached out to us to ask if mommy bloggers could use our product to help them promote Cinderella's 70th anniversary. That was a cool one. Max and Ruby just reached out to us and asked if we would help them with their 40 year anniversary, if we would allow bloggers and stuff to use our tools. We're like, yeah. <laughs> so, and then the sweater guy, if you're not familiar with Sam Barsky, the sweater guy, we're gonna be doing a website, sambarsky.com. He has a, a website already, but we're gonna be doing t-shirt versions of his sweaters because they're amazing works of art. And this guy is an internet phenomenon, if you don't know him. Um, so that, that's really, y'all, you, you <laughs> that's, that's the story. Um, I have one more little video, but it's this, this process, right? Like this simple, it seems like a simple process. It's not a simple process. My friend Daniel Steinberg, who will be up next, I quoted him on this and I love this quote. It isn't easy, you can do it. And I wanna reiterate that it's not always about changing your entire life. Sometimes you wanna be a better coder. You wanna drink more water. You know, it can, be, it can be a small thing, but the process that I applied to start poking my life and start making changes, it works. It's true. <laughs> All right, one last little thing. It's like 30 seconds. Oh, it didn't work. It's your design! Oh reaction videos are like it's just that her little shit. anyway anyway I'm so excited that I got to share this with you this morning thank you for having me I am a tool builder we are tool builders when you feel stuck on something think about the tools you have in your Mary Poppins bag you have a lot of great great tools that you have acquired over the course of your life you can use them to solve some little or huge problems. I experimented on my life, I'm proof it works. So yeah, we're, we're tool builders for life, but also like for life, for life. All right, thank you.